Start recording. Okay, recording here. Okay, so welcome everybody to the Open Source Microfactory Startup Camp. Today we're going to cover some basics of 3D printing. So it's an economics related topic. What do the numbers look like if you're talking about economically significant production, meaning either for your own self, uh, for your household, or as, a, as an enterprise to produce for the local economy. So let's, let's start with that. Let's look at uh, what the costs involved are, and that means there's three things primarily that you look at, which is the machines, the feedstocks, and the energy to run that. And then, of course, there's human time on top of that. But right now, uh, breaking that down into those categories, let's, let's look at some of those numbers. And also we'll cover not only the plastic part, which is main main way people do printing today most people do plastic printing but then we'll also look at a little bit of what it means to do other materials concrete and earth metal what are all those uh, figures look like so in other words what is possible today and practical that should be and could be done in a decentralized way so in order to inspire people to get involved in this and and have real practical impact on your own life uh, or impacting the lives in your community if you are a producer for your local community. So let's take a look at that. I'll start with startup costs, revenue basics. So what's the startup cost of, of getting into 3D printing? Well, you're going to have to have a 3D printer. Um, that cost will probably be around $1,000, maybe $500. Uh, there's definitely low-cost, cheapo printers from China for like $200. Uh, maybe they're not necessarily recommended for what we want to do. For us, our printer is $500 in parts for the open source Ecology D3D. Uh, good printers out there, for example, like Lulzbot, Mini, uh, other ones. But or, let's say around $1,000. If you build it yourself, you can do that for our printer, which is designed for industrial grade with uh, top-line parts. Uh, and we're actually releasing the version 1911 uh, pretty soon. Uh, we'll get that out next few days that we just finish the machine and it's uh, our next easier to build more powerful a more accurate model five hundred dollars in parts if you buy it off the shelf probably a thousand if you buy one of our kits we sell them for like 800 we were selling them for before and uh, that's that's it so with a thousand dollars now what, what about feedstocks so let's talk about feedstocks you can get feedstocks for about fifteen dollars a kilo uh fifteen twenty dollars a kilo uh, we get ours, I've been getting stuff from Matter Hackers, get like 10 or 20 rolls at a time, which cost $15 a kilogram. So $2, uh, well, $15 for two pounds. So about $7.50 a pound. Rough figure being $10 a pound. So that's uh, not cheap. That means that you can do a lot with that, but if it if you go to making larger objects that's not really economically efficient so you'd have to look at lower cost ways of getting filament making your own starting from recycled materials and so forth uh, but what about the the energy costs uh, that's a critical component you might say well how much does that energy count to the overall cost so let's take a look at the example of a single spool uh, which is two pounds energy costs are for a printer are about you're running about a hundred or two hundred watts for a printer and the main costs there are 40 watts for the heater element for extrusion so that's that's the main part you're running stepper motors which only take like 10 or 20 watts uh, so a small hundred watt power supply uh, we use a 100 watt power supply, but we have an external heat bed. So the heat bed can take a lot of energy. So typical heat beds may be maybe 200 watts. On our printer, we actually use a 500 watt heat bed, but it's also insulated. So we actually talk about eco-friendly eco printing. Our heat bed actually, and I actually don't know of any other printer in the world that has an insulated heated bed, but we have two inches of rock wool insulation under R so that all the heat goes up into the plat build platform as opposed to escaping through the sides or bottom. Uh, but if we use 500 watts as the power of the element, that only stays on for a fraction of the time, like 20% of the time, 10% 10, 10 of the time, depending on uh, the temperature of the room. So, But you can say 100 to 200 watts 
for a printer. Now you can also print without a heated bed, so you're under 100 watts uh, if you're printing PLA on without a heated bed, that's possible. So let's take an average figure of 100 watts. So how much does that cost? Well, 100 watts at current energy cost is one cent an hour. So it's about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, if you're running 100 watts, that's one tenth of a kilowatt. That's one cent per hour. So if you, uh, and what are the extrude, the second part is what are the extrusion rates? So that one cent to begin with is pretty insignificant in terms of energy cost. If you talk about a full spool of two pounds, uh, an average printer with a regular standard printers out there, they, they can push through about a pound per day, you know, maybe pound or maybe two pounds a day. So one roll would last you like 24 to 48 hours. Well, that, let's say, um, let's say 48 hours. Uh, so you're spending 48 hours times one cent, about 50 cents out of a whole spool of $15 or $20. So the energy costs there are quite a small fraction. You're talking about under a dollar, less than 10%, like 5% or so in energy costs. So, so primarily you're talking about the cost of feedstocks. Now, let's talk about a little bit extrusion rate. So in the standard small printers that exist out there, the typical rate is about one pound per hour. Uh, sorry, not one pound, one spool per, well, one pound per 24 hours. So one pound figure. So let's, let's look at the day as a typical scale because you're talking about prints that can take a long time and printing after all is relatively slow. So a pound for 24 hours. Uh, that's the standard nozzles. If you look at some of the larger nozzles, so, so there's, um, we use E3D Volcano nozzles typically here. The Volcano nozzles can get you, uh, if you have an extruder to run that, five pounds per 24 hours. That's the, uh, using the very common nozzles, five pounds per day. That means you're going through uh, like two or three spools in one day, like $30 of material. Now there's the next one uh, available off the shelf, the Super Volcano nozzle, which is uh, actually a much larger nozzle. It's 80 watts for that nozzle in particular. But that, the Super Volcano nozzle, so Google Super Volcano, or uh, let me share my screen and let's go to the wiki. Um, what does that look like? So let's take a look at super volcano nozzle so these are the, the larger ones you can see the length of these is much longer than a standard heater block so this is uh, yeah this is so what a block looks like so it's quite long it's about two inches or so standard blocks are like one half one third one quarter the size of this but this is uh, yeah that's a uh, it's pretty large but this can do 20 pounds per day so that's the, the baseline. So you're thinking, um, well, what's the limit in terms of the practical things you can do? Well, something that weighs 20 pounds, well, uh, you can be printing, uh, if you had the feedstock, print a two by four of lumber, plastic lumber. That's tw about 20 pounds or so, depending on the infill. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, production rate you're talking. Now, this is big. Very few people still use this. Uh, most common printers are one pound per day, which is not a lot, but if it's automated, that's what makes sense because you're not doing the work, the printer is. Extrusion costs and electricity. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that for a second. So I'm gonna show you some of the numbers here more specifically. The basic point is if, you're if your spool of wires filament is costing you, say, $20, you cannot cost-effectively print a 2x4 piece of lumber. Now, if that's also, once again, talking if you're going industrial and actually starting to print usable construction materials and so forth. Um, it would cost you, uh, if a 2x4 if a that's in plastic weighs 10 or 20 pounds, well, like 10 kilos, 5 kilos, it's like 100 bucks per 2x4. Absolutely not doable because you can get a 2x4 piece of lumber for like $3 or 
at the lumber store so you'd be <laughs> paying much much more so there's a very strong case for making your own plastic recycling and, and manufacturing local communities and a lot of people kind of uh, critique that oh you'll never get to those kinds of industrial volumes that um, the mainstream system the 700 billion dollar plastic economy produces it's like uh, a lot of people are skeptical about it but well, that's exactly the case. It's not about one person doing it, but it's about many, many people all over the world and recycling and cleaning up the environment, uh, which does make a lot of sense if you if you can include the environmental circular economy aspects in that package. So, point is, plastic filament is not affordable for larger objects. Uh, eight, pound, eight bucks a pound. Um, so, a plastic fence post would cost you like twenty-five dollars. Well fence post like a light uh, light fence post you're talking about a a 10 pound 2 by 4 for like real construction uh, people make plastic decks or whatever area around a swimming pool that does not rot it's great for the aquapana greenhouse while well, you're talking about 10 pounds that's like 80 bucks <clears throat> that's very expensive so <laughs> we need to start making our but if you now buy regrind or pellets you're getting down to a dollar a pound for the feedstock cost. Now, then you still have to extrude it or make filament out of that, but you've just gotten yourself 10x lower cost. Now, if you go down to, um, to the recycling center and buy a one-ton bale of garbage plastic, then you're getting down to 10 cents per pound. And then, of course, if you recycle your own plastic in your community or... Uh, have a collection system that you do on your own then you're talking about for free not exactly free but your labor plus the cost of electricity uh, but at that point you're talking about large objects like like lumber for construction polycarbonate glazing which can be 3d printed from scrap CDs rubber tires for your tractors uh, plumbing fittings of all sorts and all the plumbing for a CD eco home you're talking about being able to do all of that uh, affordably so that means uh, it's a high priority to get the recycling infrastructure in place and that's one of the priorities after we release the printers this coming month by the end of this year we'll be working on both the torch table and the recycling infrastructure as two very powerful aspects of this entire game especially as we're going to the incentive challenge to make the 3d printed cordless drill professional grade open source made from recycled plastic that's our goal so we'll definitely be getting into this um, for the launch of that that incentive challenge in september 2020 so let's take a look at um, what the costs are if you look at some papers out there documenting the costs of uh, electricity uh, what does it take to do at 10 to, uh, to, to print? So at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, um, if you use 10 cents per kilowatt hour as your standard cost, the cost in electricity gets pretty high if oh, that's, that's $5 in electricity. That means you're spitting out that one piece of lumber, so 10 cents, that's 50 hours. Well, that does not include so the electricity cost there uh, five dollars for a piece of two by four lumber that's quite a bit that's as much as you can adjust the electricity and that cost you as as much as what you get a piece of lumber at the store so what's the deal there that's that was done with a smaller nozzle so if you go to the much larger nozzle which can print 20 pounds pounds per day like the super volcano you're talking about half a day and still, essentially, you can you can uh, half a day would be like 2.4 kilowatt hours. Um, well, half a day is only 12 hours. That's that's 1.2 kilowatt hours. About a one kilowatt hour of electricity used. That's 10 cents. So if you go to the much larger nozzles, it becomes much more practical to print larger objects because the amount of electricity you're using in a super volcano versus a tiny uh, heater nozzle it's still like the super volcano is only 80 watts the standard nozzles are all either 30 or 40 watts so there's not much difference in uh, electricity usage by the nozzle itself but the 
real difference is the drastic increase in print speed which makes the larger nozzles practical for large objects. So this is uh, the practical implications are use a large nozzle even using off-the-shelf electricity if you're not off-grid or don't have PV panels or alternative energy uh, you can still cost-effectively produce things like a 2x4 lumber in which your electricity is going to cost you 10 cents to do that using a super volcano nozzle. So you go to larger nozzles as a start uh, the case we make for uh, going off-grid, actually, the, the great learnings from the CDCO home, but the system for the CDCO home cost us $3,000 for uh, in materials costs. So that's not including your labor, but total materials cost for 3 kilowatts, we, we paid $3,000, $3,000, so a dollar, dollar a watt price ticket. If you look at the expected lifetime of those of those solar panels, we are getting about $0.03 cents per uh, kilowatt hour as our production cost and it's actually better than it so let me show you a page on the wiki open source PV system so this is now a case for eco uh, production and community so open source PV system and there you will see the documentation so take a look at those numbers if you can if you can go through that but uh, there's a thing you want to look at is point number two there, cost of electricity production. So we are fully detailed exactly what we're doing in a CD eco home. And the number that we come up with is 1.2 cents per kilowatt hour in our PV system that's off grid. So that's pretty close to free. I mean, it's about 10x lower than grid costs. Uh, that of course is from a DIY system, so we're not counting our labor and so forth. Uh, but let's say between 1.2 cents and 3 cents per kilowatt hour for the electricity costs using photovoltaics, which now are very, very cheap. So the point is solar 3D printing, uh, off-grid 3D printing, renewable energy 3D printing, that's all game right now. That might not have been the, a game a decade or two ago when PV was 10 times or 100 times more expensive. Right now, PV is really, really cheap. Go to sunelect.com. That's where you get our panels. Uh, but they have panels, frequently have PV finished panels under 50 cents a watt. So uh, study those numbers and go from there because you might be excited to uh, pursue more solar. So here I, on this page here, I talk about more about the super volcano nozzle, 20 pound per day extrusions. So that essentially you're talking two two by fours. So we're talking about you know examples of two by four lumber, uh, the eight foot long pieces of standard construction lumber that you use in the United States and maybe other countries. Um, I don't know what the particular dimensions are in other countries, but uh, two of those pieces of lumber per day. That's great. Um, now the bottom line there is baseline. Uh, so super volcano, like I, I go through the numbers here, just just adding up the electricity, but super volcano si based system costs you 140 watts to run that printer altogether if you include the heated bed. Um, but at that level, if you're talking about uh, a super volcano and low cost electricity, uh, under 0.2 cents a pound of energy cost. Of printed plastic so you can uh, take a look at those numbers I mean by all means if any of those are wrong just uh, let me know too uh, but I'm keeping notes and some of the basic figures because you have to look back at the you know does it make sense is it economically or energetically efficient so both your time the amount of energy you put in there where you're getting your materials from but the bottom line here is that energy cost is quite negligible effectively free compared to the material costs so with that that that's that's the basic summary of uh, the economics which means the practical implications being you can do practical printing of large object the energy is not the limit you can start a business making common things uh, like plastic two by fours uh, starting a recycle a recycling center in your community with fully open source machines we're developing that full open source tool chain do it Okay, let's go into other materials. What about concrete and earth? Um, for housing, so concrete and earth for housing, there's good examples out there definitely of 
of 3D printing use, being used for construction. Uh, you can Google that. And uh, things like the concrete printed houses, um, definitely doable. Or you can talk about, so, th so this is kind of like the square structures. It's somewhat cheating uh, when you talk about a 3D printed house because the walls of a house are effectively 20% of the cost. So yeah, that's good, but still, you know, if you talk about cost savings, not super, super impressive, unless you're doing more than the walls using 3D printing. So such as uh, AI Space Factory is a great example. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, so look at this. So, so when you start printing like a B prints its house, uh, in a in a hive looking kind of a structure this is pro proposals for Mars um, and th these are proposals for Earth so actually this kind of prototype has been crowdfunded uh, this is not, I don't think that's the built one that's a, it's a, just a model but that's been Kickstarter funded and they're going forward with this so so building these kinds of homes which is quite interesting uh, now the good news for us is also that um, we're going to build a structure like this. Actually, the, we're planning a steam camp in Hong Kong with a collaborator, Cesar Harada from Maker Bay uh, in Hong Kong, who's also a TED fellow friend. Uh, but we're doing a steam camp uh, that's going forward for March 9th, where we're going to be building one of these structures like this, uh, except smaller, not, not this large. The, here, this is like this is multiple stories. We're, we're looking to do something that's about. Uh, maybe eight feet by wide by 15 feet high or so. So an initial prototype actually using our universal axis as the motion system and, uh, and a clay extruder. So that's that's exciting. I mean, you can do this. And here in the case of buildings, it boils down to essentially, this is no longer like 3D printing. I mean, this is really materials handling. So you're talking about cement mixers, concrete trucks, uh, large, you know, equipment, tractors or bulldozers for digging the soil. If you're digging up clay, I mean, that's that gets to be uh, quite uh, an endeavor, where the supporting equipment infrastructure is really the big part of it. The printer is just one one small part. So mixing, the delivery of that mud through nozzles, um, that gets into heavy equipment and kind of stuff we do with the Global Village construction set. Uh, now, in a case like this Mars habitat thing, uh, if you're talking about both walls and roof and possibly foundation being 3D printed, then you've gone more than half of the cost of the house is now truly 3D printed. So that's like, yeah, wow, that's pretty impressive. Uh, typically, the, the large costs of a house also include the, you know, you got your windows and doors and the interior finishing. But if you can save 60% on a build of a house using 3D printing, uh, that would be good if that is low cost, assuming you've got access to feedstocks. But these feedstocks are not free, as I mentioned. You need heavy equipment to access them. Uh, concrete, if you get that delivered to your site, that's still $100 per cubic meter per cubic yard. Uh, it's not that cheap. It's like uh, a cubic yard weighs like 3,000 pounds or 1,000 kilograms, close about there. But you're still talking about, um, let's say, 1,000 kilograms for $100. You're talking about 10 cents a kilogram. Uh, the weight adds up. It's not, not free, and it's uh, heavy moving of materials. But it's doable. I think a lot. Of, uh, there's a lot of people getting into 3D printing of houses. That's definitely a craze. Uh, how real that becomes, we don't know. There have been some pretty large buildings the, that have been built. Um, recently posted that on my Facebook page here. Just to show you an example of the largest building in the world is a multiple-story uh, office building that's built built in the Middle East uh, somewhere. I forget exactly where. Let's uh, see. Uh, Let's show you that picture here. Now I should plug into. I'm a little slow here. Not here. Let me plug in. Internet to get some speed.
let's take a look at the, some of the largest structures that have been 3D printed. It is quite impressive, like the things are getting bigger and bigger. So definitely there's huge potential there and a lot of people are getting into that. So it's something worth keeping a track of. With our work, we're into compressed earth blocks and we're into heavy equipment. So that kind of lends itself. If, uh, and we are doing the prototype in Hong Kong in March of a 3D printed clay structure, uh, 8 by 16 feet, 16 feet tall. Can't find it, but the, the Google the largest 3D printed building in the world. Uh, so let's get into other ma materials like metal. So you might be thinking, okay, plastic, yes, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen some houses, but what about metal? And if you look at the basic economics of metal, it's actually quite attractive because um, you can get... So, okay, first of all, what is metal printing, right? Metal printing is where you suspend a nozzle that's a you can do that simply as using a MIG welder on a 3D printer gantry axis so something that looks like this 3D printing in metal means that instead of an extruder head you've got a welder like a MIG welder with wire feed so instead of the plastic wire feed you've got metal wire feed and electricity sending current so you're welding you're depositing metal uh, in a three-dimensional shape so you might think, okay, what's what's that good for? It's not super precise. It's it's maybe three millimeters, two millimeters precise uh, as far as its resolution. But if you talk about large structures, it certainly makes sense. So if you think about welding wire plus welders plus 3D printing, there are huge opportunities that get into real large infrastructure projects, such as a windmill tower. So let's look at a wind, windmill tower. So uh, filament, metal filament now, you can get it, uh, typical cost in bulk are about a dollar a pound. So this is now metal, a dollar a pound. Uh, on Alibaba, if you go to the store, uh, the source in China, you get up down to like 50 cents per pound for the filament. But think about the MIG welder on a system, on a gantry system, like maybe the Marsha Terra, the, those uh, 3D printed houses. But a uh, um, a gantry that goes vertically so you can think about think about a, a windmill tower printed in place if you look at the economics of there it's not a super crazy idea um, so a tower that weighs 24,000 pounds 120 feet tall it's four foot diameter wide one quarter inch thick walls that can carry perhaps a 250 kilowatt wind turbine um, if you use metal 3d printing the cost of that tower would be twelve thousand dollars if you do alibaba cost now that is pretty cost effective i don't think you can get anywhere close to that um, using a large steel tube sections um, twenty four thousand pounds at the very least uh, it's competitive with what you can do with metal now if you talk about these large metal tube sections, you need cranes and things like that delivery to the site. So there's huge infrastructure and logistics costs involved in that. So if you can print that on site, perhaps that's one of the main advantages there where you can reduce costs. But the welding wire is completely affordable. If you look at the electricity cost, you, that you, if you were asking, um, yes, it takes electricity, but the electricity costs in welding are uh, about 5% compared to the, the metal deposition rate. Uh, so a tower like this, it's not, it would take you a bit of time. So, uh, the amount of time that it takes, it would take you with one single welder. If you go through the numbers, 400 hours. So if you leave that printer going for 17 days, you've got a 200 foot windmill tower. Not bad if you didn't have to do that. And, you know, think about doing that in 17 days uh, if you had that equipment in the community. Um, yeah, that's, that sounds uh, affordable or in terms of time, at least, especially if it doesn't have to be managed too much. Of course, the infrastructure to do that is, of course, a lot of details. But I don't see why this wouldn't necessarily happen. Like, for example, there's examples of 3D printed metal bridge. Let's see, 3D printed metal bridges. Uh, so that kind of 
application is getting out there. Yeah, like you can, if you Google some pictures, images, 3D printed metal bridge, um, there's one that's actually in real use, I think. I can't tell whether that's that's a fake one or not, but there's uh, basically like the robotic printers that do that. They can support themselves on a bridge, but the one that's, that is real, oh, here's, here's one. This one is a 3D printed bridge, a real picture in a real city that's somewhere in Europe and Amsterdam, uh, but using robotic arms to do 3D printing like that. So that's for people walking on that there, uh, like this. Okay, that's real. That's real there. So that was a demo. I guess that's that's in a workshop demo. But yeah, larger structures are possible. And um, if you look at the baseline cost, it is affordable based on a dollar or fifty cents a pound uh, metal cost for the welding wire. So doable. Uh, so if you're thinking large infrastructure and you, you can't see how you would get those huge windmill towers, I, I think about that. We have uh, a lot of wind farms around where we are, and it's like, well, how do you do that in any kind of a way without, say, the without really the industrial system around? Uh, well, 3D printing and welding wire using small machines uh, on towers can get you to do that. Um, uh, now, as far if you go, don't go to metal, metal that's you know you have to have a welder that's not something you do in your in your living room maybe necessarily with the fumes and everything but fiber reinforced plastics are actually one other part that's very strong so fiber reinforced plastic like like carbon fiber or glass fiber embedded in plastics like nylon you can get parts as strong as aluminum so there's uh, people doing that like for example you can right now get this a subscription for this printer it's called desktop metal this is not metal it's called fiber LT but you can rent one of these for thirty five hundred dollars uh, thirty five hundred dollars per year now I'm sure there's other costs like like the feedstock as well but you can be pr now printing parts as strong as aluminum uh, on, a, on a small desktop printer so that's that's pretty interesting uh, as you see day by day, the power of 3D printers is increasing, and of course we've w gone through a certain hype curve of 3D printers, but that's because, yeah, it's not all there yet, but it's, it can be. If you talk about uh, printing, the, one of the sad things I actually found about 3D printing that kind of really dawned on me these days is a regular 3D printer without a heated en enclosure, you're really printing, you're not really that capable, like, you can do PLA. You can do TPU, you can do PETG, but forget about anything else, like ABS. I mean, really forget about it. It's like, unless you're very close to the bed and making small parts, yes, you can print some ABS. But I think there's a lot of hype, and uh, you know, just my, my take on it is you can't print uh, any kind of a larger structure without having an enclosed build chamber. So basically, all the consumer printers that are out there, you're limited to like three materials. Um, you know, ABS is not part of the game. Yes, you can print tiny objects in ABS. Uh, but for example, we try to, uh, we have a leaf eliminator on our aquaponic greenhouse that we printed in ABS. The thing co completely collapsed, delaminated. Um, we ended up paint, uh, using PLA to do that, to print that. that. That works well. It's got thin walls and it's like a box, six inch cubic box structure. Uh, but no way for a higher temperature material like ABS. So, so just kind of gauge your expectations. The, the whole 3D printing industry on a consumer grade where people advertise you can print any material is pretty hyped up. Now you can do the fiber reinforced plastics. Those work well without delaminating and are quite strong. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, they're also much more expensive. Um, but yes, you, you can print like TPU, Ninja Flex, yes, absolutely, some rubber parts, yes, very good, uh, PLA, but everyone just prints pretty much PLA only um, because you're completely limited without a heated build chamber. So the case is there very much for a heated build chamber where you can now get into practical production of, of just about anything. So if you see that printing has not taken off, uh, that's part of the reason. I would say the main, uh, in our view, studying, like how do you, take 3D printing more into the industrial scene and local production. It's recycling film for filaments is missing. A good rubber, fast rubber extruder is missing. There are some, but a rubber extruder does not currently exist that can print three millimeter rubber. 
now I hear E3D saying, no way, hey, we print with, with rubber. Yeah, it's not the fastest rates. We're talking about now getting this to industrial rates of production, so close to like those 20 pounds per day uh, rates. When you print with rubber, you typically have to print much slower. And that's because the design of the current extruders typically has a quite a long distance, even in the printers, in the extruders like the E3D Titan Arrow, which we use, there's still, it's not by no means optimized for rubber. Um, so that's one missing link where you can't really print well uh, on a commercial scale in rubber. Uh, maybe some of the more advanced industrial printers have that, but I've never seen that in the open source and consumer, consumer 3D printing world. The third major thing is the heated build chambers, uh, high temperature build chambers. So not only enclosed, but high temperature. So think about 120 C for a build chamber, which is beyond the temperature of your electronics can handle. So you have to have a different design. But that allows you to do, for example, glazing and polycarbonate. But forget about it if you're trying to do that without an enclosure uh, in terms of re replicable high quality. Um, so we're definitely working on that. The high temperature enclosure is, is one of the things. You can look at our design on the wiki. Uh, you can study that. We've got a concept that's actually quite easy to implement. You can study that. Uh, let us know what you think. But this is the high temperature heated enclosure. That is perhaps the next greatest leap of open source 3D printing that we can take. Uh, we'll have this within probably a few months. Uh, we're not there yet right now. Right now we're getting the main line of 3D printers out there into productization. Uh, this is our next big deal on 3D printing. Okay, because if you have that high temperature heated enclosure, you can talk about now common products out of any materials without the limitations of delamination. Like, you know, um, of course people say, yes, you can print in many, many materials, but with the, the case for those is typically you're right on a bed where it's still very hot. You've got the heat from the bed still allowing you to print well on that. But for practical pr purposes, it's fair to, to generalize that you're very limited in materials at this point without a heated enclosure. Now, if you do get the heated enclosure, then you can talk about printing. Uh, let's talk about f f what we're highly interested in is common objects, nothing exotic even. You can definitely do exotic uh, stuff like high cost items, like maybe a, a phone case that costs $10, but it's got like 25 cents worth of materials. Um, you know, those are high value items. But what about common things like a 99 cent plumbing fitting? Well, our case is that, yeah, a absolutely, you want to be do that, doing that as a local business if you develop the high quality control. If you have the high temperature enclosure, which does not exist today uh, in the consumer market. Uh, but the promise is common, common objects. Take a look at Google uh, Menards and see 4 inch PVC elbow. It's about ten dollars. Hey, it's about two two pounds of material. Well, so using a larger nozzle, that could be a, a quick print uh, for ten dollars. You're talking about money, uh, common objects that everybody uses. But you need to be very careful about product strategy and product fit fit to market. Like what exactly is doable? Like that four inch elbow. Uh, well, if you use a large nozzle, the sides, the sides will not be particularly smooth. So there may be some developments that need to happen, like uh, perhaps a printer where it has a huge nozzle and then a second, secondary nozzle, which is a tiny nozzle that gets very, very fine finish. And maybe that's, a, that's an approach that if parts like plumbing fittings need a tight tolerance and can't have like little lines because they would leak um, because of the resolution of the 3D printing, uh, if you need to address that, I think there's some developments to be done there. But I don't see any reasons why um, industrial productivity on a small scale, including these very common plumbing fittings, uh, why they cannot be done. Because think about it. Okay, even a 99 cent plumbing fitting or a 20 cent, like say a half inch, I think it's like 20 cents for a pack in a pack of 20 of them, um, for a thing that weighs only a few grams. Uh, and it seems like, oh, well, to... To get a dollar for that, you know, for the amount of time you spend printing, it doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense if you're, you don't have a reliable system and you're babying the print. But in a much higher, 
higher quality system that allows you for industrial productivity, even printing things that are your cheapo 20 cent plumbing fittings will make sense. So say they take 10 minutes each, you make on a 20, you know, you make say 10 of them an hour, you know, five of them an hour, you get a dollar an hour in a day, it's, you know, you got your printer running and day you're making 24 hours. Uh, in a month, you're making $750 on 20 cent plumbing fittings, uh, assuming you have auto part harvesting, uh, which would be another uh, thing, but it's not an intractable problem. So you have your printers in the background making cheapo consumer parts. Uh, one printer is worth almost $1,000 for this really low profit margin kind of a case. So think you have a think about a pl cluster of twelve printers, which is kind of like what we're we're working on as a main kind of a production line. Twelve printers that has lots of productivity. Even if you're doing these very low margin items, and of course you have to talk about marketing and other issues, which I'm not not addressing that right now. Uh, but on the production side, your twelve printer cluster with passive uh, high demand. Uh, passive production of high demand items you're cranking out twelve thousand dollars a month uh, and without touching it in an automated system so it's definitely worth pursuing uh, definitely doable it's it will take a lot of development to get there but that's the that's the promise to get the high quality up and we definitely welcome your feedback on I mean what do you think about this I mean this is I'm not saying anything particularly revolutionary but a lot of people will uh, people in the main industrial system will be like, oh yeah, well, you'll never compete with centralized production and all of that. It's, but the, the, the truth is it's all a choice. How do we want to do this? Um, and then, of course, tech, technically wise, developments can be made to make either case doable. Because in a centralized production case, you're creating an, a throwaway society. If you're doing a local case, you've got the other advantages of recycling and 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 custom design or training local people, local jobs and so forth. So there's a much bigger picture. Uh, if you integrate the social environmental aspects to your the way you do things, this does begin to make sense. And it's part of the next economy that we'd like to create, an open, open source economy. So, um, yeah, but without even going to the, uh, the low cost, low margin, uh, pushing the limits for production of common objects, uh, look at some of the possibilities already. If you don't have your own filament, you're not using recycled materials, uh, look at the possibilities of what happens already within a world. So this is a, here's a paper. Um, okay, so Michigan Tech, that's Dr. Joshua Pierce. He's publishing a lot of papers on the economics of 3D printing. But basically, taking like t he basically took 20 common household objects like a shaver, a phone case, uh, whatever, a bunch of plastic objects, some maybe some hooks or whatever. Um, but in this paper, he's showing that for 20 objects that just about everybody buys in a single year, you'd be saving between 300 and 2,000 dollars on these 20 objects. Um, And this is only 20 items for 20 items that you would make in one year. Okay, so basically, it would cost the typical consumer. I mean, look at these. Look at these figures. It would cost you. You go to Walmart. You pay $312 to almost $2,000 to buy 20 things, but it costs you $18 in filament to make them in a weekend. Okay, that's real, but why is this then not happening? Why why is this not all over the place? Why is everybody not doing it? I think some of that is is with the quality of the the prints, like who who's uh, up to speed on um, doing it well. The perhaps the quality of the printers, where the results might not be replicable, and so forth, and maybe the work involved. So, um, bottom line being, there is potential, but it it will require some some creative entrepreneurship to make that you know for that to be made a, pos a real practical easy thing to do because right now it's not like you'd, you'd go to some random thingiverse files some of which which might be taken down or maybe your print doesn't come out the same because your printer's a little different and its settings are different 
or you try to print an ABS and you think and you think you can print it but you can't because it delaminates because uh, you don't have an industrial grade printer so a lot of different details or the fact that like in this shaver thing you still have to fit you know the shaving blade to this 3d printed part and stuff like that and it may not fit because of tolerances so details but uh, these are quality control points that we we can address with distributed quality control um, perhaps producing a turnkey package turnkey consumer production package where you provide the printer all the files and the, the whole infrastructure where, where that can be done with actually less time than it takes you to go to walmart that is possible it's not a far cry but just not how and so i think a lot of it would be cultural that we're not used to that um, maybe we don't have access to the custom thing that we need right there like for example say we uh, take a look at these 20 items covered in a paper and um, so let's take a look at i've got this paper here let's take a look at what some of these items are are there any pictures here um yeah whatever these are let's see what are there's not a lot of pictures in there but um but yeah the list is there it's uh so like things are silly stuff like Silly common stuff. I mean, uh, shower curtain rings, shower head, key hanger, iPad stand, safety razor, train track, train track toy, paper towel holder, uh, spoon holder, various things. But you know, common things. They would take you. There's all the details in the paper. But I'd say to make that really practical, a well curated design repositories common open source high power uh, production equipment that's industrial grade which as i mentioned without a heated chamber is not really there yet um a few things missing but definite case for potential on the economic front in terms of making this this real uh, but basically savings of of 350 to um numbers there are pretty staggering where if you read that it's like okay why isn't everybody do it and yes there are practical boundaries but also i think a lot a lot of that is cultural too we're not used to doing that or we don't have the time we got to go to work we got to pick up the kids or whatever uh design our next freak out file we don't have time for that uh but definitely doable so uh and there's another paper for printing rubber objects like a rubber mallet or other things so definite uh, high potential in there, um, and it's to be created. The economics are there. Like, if you, in summary, if you do have access to off-the-shelf material, you can make things that uh, make high-value objects that that are quite competitive, or things that like if it doesn't exist and you need some custom fitting, like we've done that for aquaponics and other things, custom things that don't exist on the market. That's where yes, absolutely, it makes a lot of sense. Using off-the-shelf filament at $15 a spool uh, it does make sense. For much larger objects, you you end up having to make your own filament or do that from the recycled stream. So that's now getting more advanced for infrastructure that does not really exist in open source. But the potential is there, and that's what we're working on. So join us and get involved in this, because uh, if you want to build your own local communities, because plastic is can think of generalizing quite a bit. There's plastic, ceramic, and metal. Those are like three main and biomass three or four main components of civilization plastic is huge it's a nearly a trillion dollar industry so definitely enough of it to go around and a lot of it that we can start cleaning up the environment from all the waste plastic that's out there but that would require some equipment that's open source to do that everywhere low cost uh, so we get involved so let me know what you think about this um, basic intro to the economics of 3d printing uh, comments below please uh, include them and we'll see you next time at the Open Source Microfactory Startup Camp. Bye-bye.